Um, can we can we dim these ones? So bright up here. Oh, there we go. I'm one of those people where if you turn on the light, I shh. You'll see me scurrying around the dark house at night. <laughs> Even during the daytime, I, I doused, doused the light. <laughs> I'm that guy that you see walking around uh, with sunglasses on its side. <laughs> okay, but anyways. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about hope. Um, I, don't, I think that hope is one of those things that you can never talk too much about. Um, because it always seems like people are just hungry for hope. I mean... We live in a generation now where people just feel so disconnected. Um, I've, seen, I've seen people my age just go to tears just from saying the word hope. You know, that's, that's a very disturbing, <laughs> disturbing uh, problem because, I mean, that tells me that people are so starved for hope that, I mean, they're just looking for anything, you know. So we're, we're going to look tonight about that. So I named this, this message, message Always Hope for two reasons. First off, I'm saying there is always hope. And the second thing I'm saying, always choose to hope. And so in Mark chapter 15 is where we're going to be. The Gospel of Mark in the New Testament, chapter 15. And we'll start in verse 37. Now, there are some things in life that just seem so final, so absolute that it seems like we can never, ever, ever come back from them. A lot like this dog. I mean, look at him. He really, really, really wants that dog, wants that bird there. He really wants it. But he's jumping off a cliff to do it. And, you know, the thing is, I'm not going to talk about bitterness. That I think this picture was actually supposed to be talking about bitterness. But I wanted to repurpose it tonight because that's, that's sometimes how we feel in life. That we, we just feel like things have just, it's so final that I'll never come back from this. I will never be able to push past this. This is a hopeless situation. This is just, there's no coming back from this. I am over the edge. And I'm just, there's no recovery. And I think that there's a lot of different examples I could give. Just off the top of my head, though, death of a loved one, it's always hard. Um... When our children make bad decisions, now I haven't had to deal with that too much because my kids are four and two, and, but for those of you who are old enough to have adult children, when they make decisions that you don't want them to make, it's kind of like, ah, oh, you're ruining your life. Um, work trouble, marriage trouble, debt, these are all things that, seem, that can oftentimes seem so final and absolute. And you know, the thing is, is the disciples, Jesus' disciples face this exact same thing. Okay, if you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 15, uh, verse 37, it says this. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Now, only one of the Gospels mentioned that there was one disciple, his name was John, at the cross. As far as we can tell, there were no other uh, of, the, of his disciples that were there with him when he was dying. The people who he spent all of his ministry with, 24-7, they weren't there for his death. And we don't know for sure if John was there for the whole thing either. Um, for instance, there's some parts where it seems like he might not have been there. But a side note, I guess. Um, so here we have one out of, out of, well, 12 of his closest disciples. And another one of his closest disciples, you know, betrayed him. So that's, that's great. And, uh, but then he had other disciples too, and none of them were there. Um, so here we have the disciples, and they're facing something very, very, very similar. Because this, remember, this is the guy that they're, that they're following. They think that this is the savior of the world. They think this is the long-awaited Messiah. I mean, they gave up everything to follow him. They have put a lot of stock in this. Okay? Uh, and yet, here he is, dead. So, I mean, let's just kind of put things in perspective here. Whatever hopeless situation you're going through, I'm pretty sure it's not as bad as the savior of the world dying. I think that that's pretty hopeless. That is a hopeless situation, worse than anything that we will ever have to endure. So, uh, but then here's the thing. The disciples gave up. They're nowhere to be seen. Let's move a little bit further down to verse 40, uh, verses 42 through 43. When evening had already come, 
because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, and, and Jews couldn't do things on the Sabbath. Um, they, had to, they had to stop. So the body had to be taken off of the cross before the Sabbath day hit so that they wouldn't have to violate the law. And they couldn't leave his body on the cross until after the Sabbath because it was against the law um, to leave him, uh, the Jewish law, not the Roman law, to leave him on the cross uh, until the evening. You had to take him off before the evening hit. Um, so uh, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So here we have the body of Jesus the disciples are nowhere to claim it. So they weren't there for the death. They're not there to claim the body. They're MIA. They're gone. They're AWOL. So let's go a little bit further down into verse uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. When the Sabbath is over, so now we're talking about the next day, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome uh, bought spices so that they might come and, and anoint him. Very, er, very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. So here we have, they're going to anoint the body of Jesus, okay? Still, the disciples are nowhere to be found. Doesn't that strike anybody as odd? He had hundreds of disciples. He had the 70 that he sent out. Then he had the 12 that were the closest of the closest disciples. And none of those homeboys are here. None of them. Man, oh man. <laughs> way, to, way to just <laughs> throw down on a homie, huh? So the disciples, they gave up. And they're nowhere to be found. Things are not looking good. Here we have the Savior of the world dead. Surely this is a hopeless situation. There's absolutely no hope left. So let's kind of apply this to our lives here. You know, all marriages end. They, some of them end through divorce. Some of them end through death. Some of them end through, you know, whatever. But uh, all marriages eventually end. Jobs come and go. Family problems will come. Things sometimes aren't. How we want. And life oftentimes falls apart. Sickness comes. Trouble and the unplanned come. And if you've lived anywhere past, I don't know, a day, you know that life is oftentimes unplanned. How many of you, when you were five, thought that this is where you would be at this age? How many of you thought that this is how things would go? How many of you, were, when you were in college, thought, hey, this is exactly what I planned for? Sometimes Some of you wanted to go to college and you didn't even end up in college. And that was unplanned. Life just has a way of being unplanned. And, uh, but these are, all things, these are all things that really we see as the end, uh, the end of hope. Just the end and final, there's no hope left. All of these things I had mentioned, marriages, jobs, finances, life. Family. These are all things that we say, hey, this is the final now. There is no hope. Troubles and the unplanned to come. So, but if you look, hop down to uh, Mark chapter 16, same, same chapter, but now hop down to verses 5 through 7. Entering the tomb, the, 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 the women who came to anoint the body of Jesus, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He, now, just let me add a little detail here. One of the other Gospels says that there were two men. So some people might say, well, which one is wrong? Neither. Mark doesn't say that there weren't two men. He just is focusing on the one. Evidently, the other one didn't speak. So, um, anyways, just a little side note there. Uh, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. Okay, now, keep in mind, nobody knows that he is resurrected. Nobody knows the big picture yet. It still seems like a, a hopeless situation. And the person who's reading this gospel, see, we know how the story ends, because this is 2,000 years later. But for the person reading this story, they don't know how the story is ending. They think, whoa, 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 hold on, we're worshiping and trusting in someone who died? <laughs> Now, why are we doing that? Sure, he was a good guy. Sure, he had some th good things to say. But he died. This is a pointless story to read. I'm trusting in a dead person. But then here's the clincher. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here's the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead to you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now we know 
that he actually did rise from the dead for a number of reasons. First off, the Jews wouldn't have touched his dead body because they would have been ceremonially unclean. And even if they would have touched his body, they would have brought it back out to show the, the Christians because the Christians wouldn't have put their hope in somebody who didn't really rise from the dead. The entire Christian existence is dependent on the idea that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, Chuck talked about this a few weeks ago. And Jews hated the early church because they thought they were corrupting the message of the law. So if they had the body, they surely would have presented it. Now, the Roman soldiers who were set to guard the body, they would have probably been killed for losing the body. So what would have been their incentive to hide the body? Or, more importantly, the Romans really didn't even care about the Jew and Christian thing until after 100 AD. So why would the Roman soldiers have taken the body? Well, maybe they were, maybe they were paid by the Jews. Once again, the Jews would have presented the body. Well, maybe the Christians took it. Well, yeah, people die for things that they believe in all the time. But people don't die for things that they know aren't true. So we, this is the foundational thing. We know that there was an actual person in history named Jesus. That's an inescapable fact. Even people who aren't Christians have come to this conclusion. To make the unhistorical claim that there was no Jesus is just so completely outrageous that you have to say there was no Roman Empire, there was no uh, George Washington. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. You, you can't make such baseless claims. So here we are with this, a, a fact that the body is missing. And furthermore, if they were really trying to make this story credible, they wouldn't just have used women. Women were so looked down on in the ancient world that there was no reason that why you should believe a woman's story. But here, the Gospels are saying, hey, a woman saw and heard these things. Well, that's not the most credible source you could have used there, guys. Don't you know you should have probably had a really important person, like the chief priest of the Jews. He should have been the one. See what I mean? There's just so many things in the story that, 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 that reek of, of, of it being true. So here we have this story of these events. Okay, all right. So we have this, really, it's an outrageous story. People don't rise from the dead. That doesn't happen. When people are dead, they, they die and then they decompose. But here's this, this, this person who's not where they're supposed to be with no reasonable solution as to where. And if that is true, and God has the power to do such a mighty, unheard of thing, then surely that must mean that there is no such thing as a hopeless situation. If God is able to even raise the dead, surely your situation is not hopeless. So troubles come and go, but God's promises and God's word endure. No matter what our life throws at us, no matter what the bad things are that happen, there's always hope. There is always hope. Because God's words endure. Now, if you've lived past the age of 20, you've realized a few things by now. First off, that you don't know how much you thought you did. Second off, that all those people who pretend to know a whole lot, like politicians, and no, we have the solution, or no, we have the solution, no, they're wrong, no, they're wrong, you know that they're both wrong. Neither of them have the solution either. We know <laughs> that this life gives us disappointment after disappointment. But... I can guarantee you this, no matter how old you get, no matter how, what, what you experience in your life, you're always going to find that God never lets you down. He might not answer you in the way that you wanted him to. He oftentimes does that. Sometimes we have this, this list of how he has to answer and speak to us, but God has his own plans. But I can promise you this, never once will, will God's words not be true. Never once. And I can promise you this, everyone around you will eventually let you down. Everyone will event, at least has the potential of lying to you. God doesn't even have the potential of lying to you. He cannot lie to you. Troubles come, but God's word and his promises endure. You will have marriage problems. You will have work problems. You will have family problems. Those things will come. You will have health problems. Everybody has those things that come up, but God's words will endure. When God speaks, hold on to his words. There is always hope in God. When God speaks to you, 
if you hold on to that for all this stuff, because at the end, those are going to be the only things that even matter. I can guarantee you this. Whether you lost your job isn't going to matter. Whether you lost a loved one, yeah, it's going to hurt. But in the grand scheme of things, there's more important things. There's more important things. I speak from experience. I've lost loved ones that I really didn't want to lose. And no matter what I prayed, God didn't bring them back either. And it's not like they died fairly, you know, like they were doing something messed up. One of my buddies, um, he was actually doing a ministry event, and he was coming back and was hit by a drunk driver. Well, that's not fair. It's not like he was out there doing something stupid. You know what I mean? He was, he was witnessing to kids, and he died by a drunk driver. Like, that's, that's just not very fair. See what I mean? But with all these things... There's always hope in God, even when life doesn't go how we planned. Even when life doesn't go how we planned. So I, I, I don't know what will happen tomorrow, or what struggles will come, but we always have hope. If, if we endure sickness, we know that there's a resurrection from the dead. Us getting sick isn't the last word. If we have family problems, we know that we'll inherit a new family in heaven. If every single one of your family turn, turns their back on you and walks away, you know that you have a new, new family in heaven. Right? Blood comes and goes. I mean, you guys who have, been long, who have lived for long enough to make it to adulthood, you know. Blood comes and goes. Family, family, friends, they all come and go. But God's family that he gives us doesn't pass. When, when we part with a family member in heaven, it's for a limited time. We know where they went, and we can count down the clock till we get to see them again. That's a family that endures. God works in every situation for his glory and our good. It doesn't matter what's going on. It's not that God causes every bad thing to happen to you. That's not what I'm saying. But he works in every situation. He's always on the move. He's always turning things for his glory, and now he's trying it for our good. He just has a way of working through terrible situations. I don't know how he does that. Like we had someone come a couple Sunday nights ago and they said about how they, how they got cancer again. This is like the third, I think she said it was the third time that the cancer has, has resurfaced. But what was the good from that? She was able to reach someone who had just been diagnosed with, with breast cancer as well. See, now in our thinking, that's not fair. I want to live a long, healthy life and for nothing bad to ever happen. But God has other plans. <laughs> and... Uh, and he has other plans. <laughs> Let's just leave that at that, huh? <clears throat> so even in pain or times of doubt and struggle, we live by faith and not by sight. What does that mean? We have to not be so distraught by bad news, by opposition, and we instead have to remember what God said because the things that are around us are fading anyways. See what I mean? Well, this person, they were talking behind my back. What does the Holy Spirit have to say about it? When something, when you hear bad news, when something bad happens in your life, don't take it for face value. Immediately, go to the Holy Spirit. There, there have been multiple situations where really, really, really bad things have happened. But I wasn't discouraged for one reason. Because the Holy Spirit was talking to me, and, and he told me there's a bigger picture here. Now, I'd like to say that every single time something happened that I'm always on top of my game, that's not true. But I am saying that there are, have been times when focusing on the Spirit has changed my perspective on those things. So, um, we live by faith, not by sight. And here's the thing that we all have to eventually learn. God often allows our dreams to die so he can do the impossible. And I'm going to show an example of that in a minute. But there was a pope. His name was Pope Gregory the Great. Or if you know popes, it was Gregory the First. Either or. Um, this guy was a monk. And he wanted to stay that way. He just wanted to be left alone in his monastery. And hey, you know, that's good enough. And, uh, well, they didn't want him to do that. They dragged him out of the monastery and made him be the pope. <laughs> And so he wrote a letter to the emperor and said, hey, I really don't want to do this. Can you just not 
have me be the pope so I can go back to being mocked. And the bishop intercepted the letter and forged a fake that said, please reinstate me as the pope immediately and sent it to the emperor against Pope Gregory's <laughs> wishes. And so he was instated as the pope and he hated it and he hated it. But because he became the pope, he sent a man named Augustine to Britain who brought Christianity to Britain. And within a hundred years, there was a strong enough Christian presence on the island to affirm it as under the pope's um, authority. Now, we are in a Protestant church, so that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but basically the idea is there was a strong uh, Christian community in Britain after not even a hundred years. See what I mean? That's how we want to live our lives. God, send me back to the monastery. I don't want to do this. This thing that you got going on here, that, that's good for you, God. That's your plan. I've got a plan that involves me being back there at the monastery. I want to be a monk. I want to be happy, left alone, and no problems. That's what I want, God. Pope Gregory was over it. It's not that he didn't love people anymore. He was tired of all the nonsense, and he just wanted to go be in a monastery. Can you relate to that? I think Pope Gregory is one of the most relatable characters in history because that's how we all feel. God, I want to be back there. But instead, he gets drug out of his happy little home in the mountains and instead has to be the pope against what he wants to do. And he actually did a fairly decent job. But my point being, there was, there was something that needed done and he couldn't have done it in the monastery. You see what I'm saying? God often has a way of killing our dreams so that he can do the impossible. God, I will never be the Pope. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, ho, ho, okay, Gregory. Let me show you how this is done. So just a few things in conclusion. A great example of the whole God-killing dreams is Israel. You have Israel in the book of Genesis, okay? This is sometime around 2000 B.C., 2000 BC, the people of Israel weren't even a thing yet. It consisted of one nomad with his half-sister that he had married, living in the desert. That's not a nation. That's a couple of inbred hillbillies. That's what that is. But instead, God gives them a promise that he's going to give them a home. And Abraham says, well, how the heck are you going to do that? I don't even have a son. My estate's going to go to this guy who works for me. So that's in Genesis. Then by the time that we get to Exodus, 400 years later, this is somewhere in 1450 14, somewhere. They're in slavery in Egypt. Boy, things have really looked up here, God. I'm glad you promised me a home here because, man, this is exactly the home that I had envisioned, serving as a slave. Well, then we get down to the book of Joshua. And where are they at? They're having a bunch of battles so that they can go to their home. So, okay, we're at the end of Joshua. They're in their home. Finally, the promise has been fulfilled. Well, not quite, because then we hit this next stage where they have to constantly fight just to stay in their home. That takes us through the books of Kings and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. And there they are, you know, living in the, living in the promised land. They're, the Messiah is nowhere to be found, but here we are under Roman control. Surely this is not what you had in mind, God. You see what I mean? God has to kill our dreams. Okay, God, I want a home. You promised me a home. This is good. Well, so kill it. Kill it some more. Really just make sure that dream is dead. I mean, really. And now... What do we have to show for all this long time of struggles and dead dreams? We will inherit a new heaven and a new earth. We will live with God in eternity where there won't even be a temple because God himself will exist with us. That is something that has never occurred in human history, not even with Adam and Eve. God, Adam and Eve themselves did not see God the Father Jesus appeared to them in, in, in form of some kind. It doesn't say exactly what form. But God the Father was hidden from them. No human has ever seen God the Father. That's going to change. 
Now that is something that gives us hope. And that is something that won't die. That is something that won't die. So remember that God sometimes kills your dreams to do the impossible. There was a story that Lee Strobel shared um, a couple weeks ago on Twitter. And basically there was this loud atheist. Now I don't mean loud as in he had a voice that carried. I mean he was a very verbal atheist. God's stupid. You have to be an idiot to believe in him. You know, just a very outspoken atheist. And before, right before he died, he said, I just want to go home. God, take me home. God, take me home. And the last thing he said before he died was a prayer to go home. God does the impossible. You know, I bet there was someone praying for him. Someone who thought he will never get saved. Someone who thought he's a pain in the butt. Get him out of here. And God did the impossible. God did the impossible. So remember this, there's more. There's more than this. There's more than the mortal world around you. And there's more than the problems that you endure. Sometimes we go through so many problems, we feel like the problems are all that exists. But there is more than the problems. And past the problems, there is life. Never forget that. If you've ever done this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've ever stared at a computer screen for a long amount of time, and then you walk outside, everything looks bigger. Because you've been focusing so hard on the screen for so long, you get tunnel vision. And then you go outside and everything looks bigger. You're like, wow, has my tree always been this big? You know what I mean? It feels like, whoa, I'm, I, I'm, if you guys have ever played video games, when you play Mario and you go into the miniature world and you're the little guy and there's all these big mushrooms, it feels like that. You walk outside and you're like, wow, the world looks so big. That is a lot. That is a lot like heaven's going to be like. We're staring at this computer screen and we think we know things. We think we understand things. When we get to heaven, it's going to be like walking outside for the very first time. Whoa. This is not what I anticipated, God. I thought there was going to be less. I thought there was going to be not so great. I think somewhere in our, in our heads, we kind of miss how big God is. And we kind of miss how happy heaven is. Well, I'm scared to die. Well, don't worry. Once you die, you only have to do it once, and then you're, not, you're never going to be scared again. So, hey, that's good. So you have to remember that God is always working. And remember this more than anything. The journey is not the destination. The journey is not the destination. You are on a journey. Your, your life is a journey. When you're a kid, you don't really think about it. But then as you get older, you think, holy crap, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Then you get older, and you're like, wow, I'm really close to dying. Mm -hmm. And then, you, and then you, start, you start adding up the, ta you start tallying your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm this old. That means I have this much longer. Oh, my goodness. I'm never going to be able to go on that cruise that I wanted to go on. How am I ever even going to pay off my credit card? You know, and you start, you start looking, and you start adding up, and you start, okay, if I make... If I get a job, a good job, and I make this much a year, and I, if I save up for the rest of my life, I might, I might have taxes paid by the time I die. You know what I mean? You just start really adding this sucker up, and things start seeming very, seem very daunting. But remember that the journey is not the destination. You will go through struggles. It's part of the journey. But it's not the end goal. You are on a journey, and journey in past is the past. You might say, well, I, I've, I've messed up. You know, I, I'm, you know, this or this and has happened. The past is the past. The thing about a journey is it's not like a video game. On a video game, if you mess up, you can reload a past save. In the real world, if you mess up, it's in the past. You can either sit there and stare at your problems, or you can move towards the future. But you can't do both. It's an all or nothing kind of deal. So you have to do like he said, like Paul says in Philippians, press forward to the hope in Christ. Because you have everything to gain and absolutely nothing to lose. As you go through life, remember that everything in this life will be destroyed by fire. Yes. You can spend your whole life trying to make monuments for yourself, trying to leave markers, and you lived on this planet, trying to accumulate all the things that you think will make you happy, but it won't. But it won't. 
When you realize that everything you have and everything that you could ever build in this life will be burned by fire, there's only one thing left to remember. That we have a hope that will not be burned with fire, that will never decay, that will never lose its efficiency. Remember that. There is always hope. There's always hope. And no matter what situation you're in, you can guarantee that if you look for it, you'll find hope. Always guaranteed. As one last example in the book of Philippians, Paul is saying about these people, have you ever had those pastors who just always seem like there's, they've got something that's bothering them? They think the whole world is against them. You know, they see themselves as the martyr, oh, poor, poor me, and you know, every other pastor is an idiot, and they're the only pastor who has it right. Have you ever met those kinds of pastors? Well, Paul in the book of Philippians is dealing with pastors who are, who are preaching the gospel. They're telling people about salvation just to make Paul mad. They're trying, they're trying to irritate Paul. You know what Paul says? At least the gospel is being preached. Remember that. There's a dark side and a good side to every situation. What you focus on is really up to you. Really up to you. But remember that we have a hope that does not die. If I could... Uh, I'm looking at my...